Well, good morning. Uh, if you have a Bible, please turn it open to Revelation chapter 6. Grab your notes. There is so much to go through today. I don't have fancy introductions. It is, uh, we're just going to jump straight into the deep end together. Does that sound okay? Okay, good. Uh, we've been in a series on the book of Revelation, and we did it through Easter. So if you were with us through Easter, uh, we talked a little bit about that. We're going to do a little recap for you. So if you're new today, uh, you'll get a little bit of an idea of where we are. But um, like I said, there's so much to cover. We just got to jump right in. And the very first thing I want to jump in with is actually an old series that we did on the book of Exodus. A couple months ago, actually about a year ago, we did a series on this character study of Moses and who he was and, and uh, what he did and what the book of Exodus says. And one of the reasons why I did that is because I knew eventually I would teach on the book of Revelation. I didn't know exactly when, but I knew eventually that I would do that because so many of you had asked. And I thought, okay, one of these days when, when the Lord prompts, I'll do that, but first I want to do Exodus. So go through Exodus. And one of the reasons why uh, one of the, not the reasons why, but one of the things I really wanted to communicate to all of us through the book of Exodus was, what does God's judgment look like? What does it look like when God judges? And if you remember in the book of Exodus, there's all these plagues. And we kind of asked the question of like, man, there's all these innocent Egyptian people who are just like getting decimated by these plagues. People are dying and losing children and, and like animals are dying in the fields. Like, what is going on with God's judgment? Why does God's judgment seem so cruel and so harsh? And we talked a little bit about this, and the answer that we came up with, what we talked about, was that this was a cosmic battle between Pharaoh and between Yahweh. And Pharaoh upheld the illusion of power and control. Pharaoh said, I control all the food sources. I control all the people. I control um, the economy here. I'm in control of the military. I'm in control of our safety. And what God did was say, okay, Pharaoh, you call yourself a God of your people, a God of all these things, but I am the true God. And so what God allowed to happen was what God is most in control, well, all in control of everything, but what God is so in control of is his creation. He allows his creation to fall into this sort of what we call decreation. And he allowed creation to just go completely wild in front of Pharaoh. And that was his judgment, was to allow Pharaoh's sin to come back on Pharaoh's head. So he used Pharaoh's sin in order to judge Pharaoh, to tell Pharaoh, hey, because you believed you were God over creation, because you had your heart hardened towards me, I've allowed all this evil that you've done, all this evil that you've perpetrated to come right back on your own head. And that was God's judgment over Pharaoh. If you remember back from that series, we talked a lot about that. Evil eventually implodes under its own weight. We talked a lot about this sort of stuff. And we talked about the destructive nature of evil. And this is why we need redemption, by the way, and salvation. We need salvation precisely for this because we are a people who sin. And sin brings about evil in this world. And we will eventually collapse under our own weight. And what the redemption of Jesus does is frees us from that. And this is, yeah, amen. And this is why we need redemption. Because God's judgment is coming. And it's a good thing. And we're going to talk about that today. God's judgment is a good thing. We're going to talk about that today, too. So I just wanted to remind us right up front, like I said, we're just going to jump right into the deep end, right in the beginning, because there's so much to cover today, and it's all deep end Bible type stuff. And I'm trying to realize that we're all treading water in the deep end, but I'm trying to, to throw us all floaty once or twice. I don't know if these metaphors are catching on. But if you know me, you'll know I will mix many metaphors today. Okay. So I also want to give a disclaimer about what I'm about to preach today. Most of my preaching does not come with disclaimers, but this today does. So if you're new today, uh, you're not going to hear this that often, but today you will. It would be impossible for me to teach these next segments of Scripture, these next little pieces of Scripture, without talking about the politic of the empire of Rome versus the politic of the Lamb, Jesus. It would be completely impossible. And what I mean by the politic is what I mean by the, it's just the way that they operate, their worldview, what they, what they choose to do. So it would be impossible for me to talk about that without 
talking about Rome versus the Lamb. And I talk about the politics of each one. Now, the challenge with that, and you guys all have to do me a personal, can you all do me a personal solid, a favor? No. They're, you're like, no, nah, we're going to get you. I need a personal favor from you. And, and that's, here's my personal favor. Would you, you're going to be tempted to try and figure me out politically. You are. I, I'm going to ask you not to do that. Because you're going to hear this message today, and you're going to be like, ah, I knew he was, I knew he was a Biden guy. I, know, I knew he was a Trump guy. You're going to come out with two different conclusions. That's, that's what you're going to do. Don't do that. Do me this personal favor, solid. Like, we're all good friends, right? We, let's do that personal solid. Amen. Christ is in the center. So today, uh, we're in a different position than the church three hundred the, in the first few hundred years of the church. So we are actually having to get in our time machine and look back at this first century church and the way that they were receiving this message for the very first time. And that's what I hope to do today, is to, to take us back to the first century and look at the way that they would have understood Revelation chapter 6. With all these disclaimers, you could tell this is like an explosive passage, okay? Um, I'm like building the hype up. For the first, we're in a very different position than we were from the church of the first 300 years. Around 400 AD, there was an emperor who became a Christian, and all of a sudden, Christians had access to power. And all of a sudden, Christianity drastically changed after year 400. And so as we go back to the first 300 years, I want you to realize something about the church. We are 21st century Americans right now, okay? That informs so much of the way you read the Bible. And, and it's impossible to almost get out of that filter and read it like first century Christians. It takes a lot of work. But you have to understand, the church of Revelation was completely excluded from governing life. Are you excluded from governing life? No, you get to vote. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. But the church in first century life was completely excluded. It was a church that was persecuted. And today, I mean, is the church in America really, like, maybe people call you names sometimes or something? No, you're not getting killed for your faith here. Let's be honest. No one's getting killed in America really for their faith. This is a church in the first century that was getting killed for their faith. They had targets on their back. It was a church that was always on the brink of a of disaster. And, and we're just not, you guys. We're just not in the same place. It was written to a group of people that practiced a religion that was illegal and died for their involvement in it. And ours is legal. I mean, so legal, it's written into the Constitution, right? Like, this is why people emigrated to America for years and why people still do is because of religious freedom. So, like, we are in a very, very different place than the church of the first century. That's what I'm trying to get across today, or at least as we start before we even jump into the, into the structure. Okay, and then lastly, one more piece of introduction, and then we're going to just jump right in because there's a lot to cover, like I said. Structure. I talked to you guys about structure before, and I think structure is so important in understanding how do I understand the book of Revelation as a whole so that I can see what God is doing in God's good, great, vast universe. So remember, the very first chapter is John, the apostle, Jesus' good friend, seeing this vision, the resurrected Jesus. He's dying on an island by himself, and he sees his friend standing before him, giving him this new vision about what's to come. And then the very first thing that Jesus decides to do is spend two chapters talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly of his seven churches, or the church. Remember, we talked about this in terms of a lawsuit. In today's terms, that's what Jesus is doing as he's laying out his case of judgment against the church, the problems that he has with her, and he's praising the church for the good things the church is doing. And then we go to chapters four and five, and that's what we looked at um, over Easter and the week before, and that is God in heaven, and we're looking at the divine courtroom happening, God's court, where he judges the nations. And at first, he starts with this church. And then after chapter 5 comes chapter 6. And then he begins to judge what we call as a new character in Revelation, Babylon. Now, Babylon has not existed for 500 years, but it's what John will call Rome. 
Babylon is a symbol, and we're going to get way into it in the next few weeks, but it's a symbol that's used in the biblical world as this evil empire. Okay, and we'll talk a whole lot more about all of that. So this is what's happening. Chapter 4 and 5, they're, they're the center. They're right in the middle of the book theologically. Before that, he judges the church first, and then next he's going to judge Babylon second. So starting in chapter 6, God unleashes judgment against these earthly nations. And it's the, the giant, you know, white whale that John is talking about here is Rome. So this is kind of this motif that God is holding court. Okay, with all that being said, uh, Revelation chapter 6, we're only covering eight verses of Revelation today, guys. Um, I tried to cover the whole chapter, and then I, I texted the staff. I was like, it'll take two hours. I can't do it. And uh, so just first eight verses. <laughs> we'll stay. Yeah, I'll get hungry. I'll get bored of myself, though, Pete. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his rider's name was Death, and and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with, with the sword and famine and pestilence by wild beasts of the earth. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Does anybody want to get baptized after that? right? (laughs) It's hard. This text is difficult. Keep in mind, this is the lamb opening the scroll, like we talked about last week. Only the lamb is worthy to open up this scroll, which is God presiding over human history, which is God's judgment over the earth. The, The lamb is opening this scroll. And keep in mind that when we read about the four horsemen, we're not reading the scroll itself. You, you got to pop all the seals in order to read the scroll. But this is just the effect of what's happening. As God gets closer to opening the whole totality of human history, opening the scroll, what the picture you're supposed to get is evil begins to freak out. Why? Because God's judgment, the final things, when Jesus comes back, it's about the abolishment of all evil. And that is a good thing. And so evil knows its days are numbered. And so as the lamb is opening these scrolls and you you begin, you know, John starts to borrow from the book of Zechariah. And if you read chapters one and chapter six in that book and and do this whole comparative study, you're going to find that they're judging the the evil nations that hurt Israel. And, And so what he's doing right here is he's borrowing from that book and he's writing it in his to tell you he's judging these nations that are hurting the church. And so he's borrowing from context, but what's happening is he's saying that as the scroll gets closer and closer to its totality, as Jesus comes, as it gets sooner and sooner and sooner for Jesus to return, evil freaks out and bad things happen. And there's tribulation and there's difficult things, and evil is in anticipation of its own demise here, and that's why it's freaking out. Its days are numbered. So we have to talk real quick. We're going to get down. We're going to break down each one of these horsemen, I promise you. But we got to talk real quick about empires. Empires, just like Egypt, like we talked about just a moment ago, give you the illusion of control and power. Empires are all about control and power. Military control, economic control, food control. Rome was one of these empires. It was the biggest empire at the time. And Revelation was written to the church of the Roman Empire. It's a picture 
A picture that the church would have had in its mind would have been Egypt. In all the old, in all the first century uh, texts that we have of the Bible that still exist, we know that Exodus existed in all of them. The first gen- century church absolutely knew the text of Exodus. In fact, it was a text that they reminded them themselves of once a year at Passover. So they have the Passover meal, and what would they do? They'd retell the story of Exodus. They'd sing the song of Miriam. They would talk about these. So there's echoes of Exodus all the way through the entire Bible because it's what the first century church was thinking of. So you remember the story of Pharaoh. He had this mythology of control and power. He was in control of the military, the food production, people and things. And when Pharaoh is in control, he literally puts himself in place of God over his people. But Moses comes in and disassembles Pharaoh's sense of control and power. And the way he does that is by allowing God to move and by coming in as God's spokesman is really what he does. He throws the staff down and becomes a snake and he shows that he's the real snake crusher snake. I know that's a reference back to Genesis chapter three. But anyways, that God is more powerful than his water supply. God is more powerful than his food supply and production. God is more powerful than his economy. Even toward the very end, Pharaoh couldn't even control the life of his firstborn son. He couldn't even control his own household. So what God is doing in the book of Exodus is showing Pharaoh, your power is just a, it's just a myth. It doesn't really exist. My power is what really exists. So I'd argue that this story wasn't there for Pharaoh, but is for the Israelites who will tell the story over and over and genera- for generations to come. And this is, we're getting to the first fill-in. To understand the central question of Exodus is to help us find meaning in Revelation. So you have to understand Exodus to, in order to find meaning in Revelation. Are you all still with me? Okay, good, 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 good. good. Okay, so the first fill-in is the central question of Exodus. Will you identify with Pharaoh and his false power or the Passover lamb that is the center of salvation. You have to remind yourself, what saved the Hebrew people? Oh, it was the lamb that was slain. In Revelation, what stands at the center of the throne? The lamb that was slain. These are echoes of Exodus that the, that the author John wants you to see. Like, hey, just as Pharaoh has this mythology of power and control, Rome's got the same thing going on, and we worship the lamb. We are lamb people. We are not horsemen people. Who will you identify with? So let's talk about this white horse, the rider with a bow and a crown. So the politics of the empire are left and right and everything that goes in the middle. And there's this politics of a different kind altogether, and that is the lamb. So before I break this all down, again, don't listen to this as Americans, 21st century Americans. It's going to be almost impossible to divorce yourself from that. But try and listen to it as the first century church. Try and think about it as the church. There's an awful lot that what I'm about to say that you might say, oh, he's doing a polemic against America. He's critiquing America. And that's not what I'm trying to do today. I'm trying to help us understand the way the church understood this. Okay. I'm laying out my landmines right in front of you guys. Revelation 6, let's read it again, verse 1 through 2. Now I watched when the Lamb opened the seven seal, uh, one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice, like thunder, come, And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and his rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him. So he came out conquering and to conquer. The white horse is about conquering. It's about power. It's about military. I think the best way to see the horse and their riders is that they're cosmic agents of evil. Now, Jesus shows up later on a white horse, and a lot of people want to say that that's the same white horse, but I think there's a lot of good Textual reasons in the book of Revelation why it's not the same white horse, and Jesus is not that white rider on this horse. There's a number of interpretations on this text, and the one I've decided to go with today, in fact, if you read all the commentaries, I guarantee you they will fight over this verse. In fact, they quote specific reader, uh, specific other authors. Well, this guy says this, Beale says this, Ayun says this, and they're, they're all fighting with each other on this. So what I decided to go with is 
how would the first century have understood this text? How would the first century church have understood it? So on the eastern border of Rome, there's this massive empire called the Parthenians. This is, they held the Arab Peninsula, and they're a constant threat to Rome. They were famous for their white horses and riders with bows and arrows on them. That's what they were famous for. That's what they were known for. They had the archers, the best archers in the ancient world. So at this point in the text, there's this idea that, that one day the empire might collapse, the Roman Empire it might collapse. Um, and, and, and what I think John is trying to say is to the church is, this empire is eventually going to collapse, and it's not going to collapse to this, the Parthenian rule, but it's going to collapse because of a judgment from God. So the problem is that Rome wants to expand east, and Rome has all these big guys in armor, and, and the way that Rome feels safe is by more military spending, more chariots, more army guys, more strength, more might, more all of that, so that they could overwhelm their enemies. That's the way that they felt in power, and that's the way they felt in control. But here's what the Parthenians did. They got on their white horses, and they rode around the forces. They flanked them, and they went into the back, and they shot arrows from a distance, and they caused destruction, and they fought this sort of asymmetrical warfare, and they were killed a lot of Romans, and then they would bail out, and you would never confront them in a face-to-face -face battle because they were like these like terrorists, you know? They just fought different. There was constantly this threat at the border, and that's what the white horse represents, this, this military empire. I mean, can, can you imagine always having the greatest power in the world at the time? You're Rome. You've got the greatest military, the fiercest military, the best military technology, the best chariots, the best horsemen, the best all of that. But what John is saying to, is that Caesar thinks he's full of power and authority because of this military, but the reality is he knows full well that there's powers out there that he can't control. He knows full well that there's this Parthenian power that he just cannot control at all. And there's always going to be an enemy at the gates. And what do you do if you're Rome? What do you do if you're that empire? The, the, the Roman Empire has to learn a politic of, of, we need cooler weapons. We need bigger weapons. We need more chariots. We need more spears. We need more bows. In order to feel safe, what we need to do is we need to raise the death toll of those people. It, it reminds me of a quote by General Patton. And he said, wars, and I'm going to actually clean it up and not say the cuss words that General Patton said, okay? Because I'm preaching. And that would be bad. He said, oh, if war isn't won by dying for your country, it's by making the other poor person die for their country. It's learning that politic, right? That we just have to kill more of the bad guys. And if we kill more of the bad guys than we lose, then we're going to be fine. We're going to be safe. It's crazy, right? Like, we know that that's crazy. And the empire is always going to be collecting more taxes, more Roman taxes because they need bigger weapons and better weapons and better control on the border and, and, and better foreign relations and better all this stuff. So the question, here's the question of the white horse. What does it mean to really be safe? Are we safe because we've got a strong border? Are we safe because we've got the best weapons? Are we safe because we're in the biggest empire? Are we safe because we've got the best stuff, the best military in the world? Or are we safe? So the question is, who will you find your sense of safety in? The empire or the lamb? And I think this is the question to the first century church, and it's the question to us today too. Who are you going to get your safety from? Because we all know, I mean, our world is, it is like just descending into chaos at the moment. You look at what's happening in Israel right now, and it is like, uh, I sent my wife the meme of the dominoes falling. It is dominoes falling. You know, it's crazy out there. And this is the way that all empires act, is how the white horse gets lived out. And so here's the deal. No matter how much you build up your white horse power and prestige, it never goes well. The threat's always going to be there. There's always going to be other white horses coming for you. It doesn't matter how bad and big and bold your white horse empire is. There's always other horses. And then next is a red horse. This is fun. Revelation 6, 3 through 4. 
When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and came out another horse, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. So if the white horse is the threat from the outside that makes Rome freak out, the Parthenians, ah, then the red horse is the threat from within. If you read any Roman history at all, you'll know that they are always executing insurgents. It's one of Rome's favorite things to do. They execute insurgents. In fact, these are some of the fake charges that were brought against Jesus because they can't afford to have this battle happening, this civil war happening inside of the empire. Because if civil war happens again, like it did for Rome way earlier, if it happens again, then guess what? Their borders are open and there's a threat from the white horse. So they can't stand to have civil war. So you always need to build this movement and this power of crushing your internal enemies. Rome had some of the most sophisticated spying networks. I I would say under King Herod, it was much more like the Gestapo and, and, uh, you know, any of these systems. uh, Because they spied on their own people, always concerned about who was going to build a, you know, build up against the empire. Always concerned about who would go up against what the empire says. So imagine with me a system of government that's always worried about the threat from within. For some reason, I'm sorry, for Rome, this is the biggest threat that there was because civil war would absolutely ruin them. It makes the threat of invasion way higher. And you always have to put down that threat. It's the politic that once you have your power, you got to keep it. You got to keep it at all costs. I mean, think about the regimes through history that practiced the politic of the red horse. The, the Russians had the gulag, right? They, they had to stop the people from rising up in their own system. So we got we to silence them. Pol Pot killed all of his enemies, you know, and, and North Korea has execution and work camps. Like it's just, the, the point isn't to point to a specific empire here and be like, oh, the red horse. And many of you have heard this, by the way, if you've paid attention to like, you know, Jesus coming back systems, end time systems. Many people have like, oh, the red horse is definitely Russia. And I've heard this before. And I'm going to tell you, it's not Russia. And it is Russia. And it's not China, but it is China. And it's not any, the point of the horses you guys, is that this is how every empire acts. Every empire in world history just simply acts this way. And the point is, do you want to act like these horses, or do you want to live like them, or do you want to live like the lamb? That's the point. In fact, a great case study in how all the horses work out, and many commentators will talk about this, is that the horses are all in this sort of descending order. Like when war happens, then there's civil unrest, and then there's all these other things that happen. World War I is a perfect example of this, and this is why when World War I happened, many people are like, well, Jesus is coming back today. You know, there's this massive movement built around Jesus coming back at World War I because there was World War I, and guess what? All these nations, the white horse freaked out. The white horse went crazy. And, and all these empires are fighting each other. And then guess what? 1917 hit the Russian Revolution. There was a civil war. One of the, and it was crazy. You know, and there's the rise of communism, all that stuff. And, and then what happened? Oh, then there was famine, the turnip winter in Germany and all these other places. They only had turnip seed. They barely had any food because war decimated the food population. We're going to talk about that next. And then lastly, Spanish flu, 1918. Killed off a bunch of people. That's all four horsemen right there. The idea is that as empires try and hold on to this power and control, this is something that's happened in every empire, in every time of our world. It's not something that's specific to 21st century right now. And I'll tell you this, even though we are always closer to Jesus returning, it is biblically improper to point to one nation and say, that's the nation that this is talking about. And I'll tell you why. Because the first readers of the book of Revelation could have never understood that. And so what you're saying is the book is only intelligible to our generation and was never intelligible to their generation. Does that make sense to you? Okay. 
it's a part of academic arrogance that we need to walk through and say, this applies, the Bible applies to all generations, not just specially to ours in the 21st century. Okay, I'm getting into my, I'm getting into professor mode. Let me get back into pastor mode. Okay, so the politic, this is your next film. The politic of the red horse asks us where we will find true peace in the empire or in the land. Where will you find true peace? In the empire or the lamb? And by the way, the empires are gonna, of this world are going to test you on this. You know, as world events start to freak out, as, as the world starts to, to go crazy, it's, it's going to test you on this. And like, do you really trust in the lamb or, or do you trust in military spending? What do you trust in? Amen. Okay. Black Horse, verses five through six. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of a four living creatures say, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the olive oil and the wine. This is the horse of famine. So back in to Pharaoh and his mythology of control and power. He had this mythology that he controlled by his hand. He controlled the economy because Pharaoh was the breadbasket of the ancient world. They, they took care of, like, you, you have to understand, in, in the end of Genesis, when there was a famine, where did everybody go for food? They went to Egypt. Egypt was the breadbasket. Pharaoh had the control. There was the mythology of, like, we're in control of all this stuff, Right? And what the text is saying here is it takes about a full day's wages, a denarius, just to feed one person. And that's what happens when the empire's horsemen go out of control. When the, all of these horses go out of control and these agents of evil go out of control and judgment is starting to happen and all that stuff. Food is scarce. The economy, inflation starts to go crazy. That's why one, one denarius for one person's food, how am I going to feed my entire family? It's World War II when Right before the outbreak of World War II, Germans were, said they would take wheelbarrows full of cash to buy a loaf of bread because inflation went out of control. This is what happened when human systems run amok. There's this note, not to touch the oil and the wine. Here's the strange thing about famine. It seems like the wealthiest always seem to have plenty of food, oil, and wine, Right? I mean, I think about one nation where there is a famine happening right now. And I'm not saying that this horse applies to that nation. I'm not saying that. That's, oh, you just heard my rant. It's biblically improper. I'm not doing that. It's just an example. North Korea. There's famine. There's people starving there. But is the leader of North Korea starving? No. He looks like he's doing okay. There's like a totally a North Korean hit out on me now. Okay. <laughs> they live in abject poverty, but their leaders are doing great. That's the point. That's the politic of the black, black horse. Um, imagine this with me. Empires give off the myth that they're in control of the economy. Like We've got the economy covered, right? We got it. It's okay. And then bubbles burst. And, the, and then financial downturn happens. And, and then... It, then you realize you're like, all this thing, all this government empire saying, oh, no, 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 we're fine. We've got this. It's under control. It, you realize they don't have any control at all. They're just telling you to raise confidence so the stock prices won't drop. Not that I'm talking about a specific nation or a specific time. The horse breaks down the myth that somehow we're in control of our own economy. The question of the black horse, this is a fill-in, is who do you trust as your provider? The empire or the lamb? Who do you trust? Jump into the pale horse. It's the fun one. Verses 7 through 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and the famine and with the pestilence and the wild beasts of the earth. This fourth horse is a symbol of things like plagues 
And, and, and things happen throughout human history like plagues. The Black Plague, for instance, in the Middle Ages, conservative estimates say a quarter to the population died. And like insane estimates say two-thirds of the population died. That's a pale horse. But you look back to Pharaoh again, and Pharaoh is a guy who's in the myth that he's in control, and he's unable to control the death and life of his first son and all of Egypt's sons with him. Plagues just highlight that we don't have any control. Does anybody remember a couple years ago? <laughs> Even in our recent history with COVID, once the vaccine came out, at first it was like, get vaccinated, we go back to normal, no masks and all that, we're fine, you go back to big events, you can do all that stuff. And it was like, you know, even the vaccine gave the illusion of control because after everybody got vaccinated, they're like, oh, wait, shoot, we could all still get sick and everybody can still transmit this stuff. Oh, we're not as in control as we thought. As humans, we just show these horses off in our lives because we like to pretend that we've got control over everything. And so John says, all Rome needs is one good plague. You know, realize you're not in control. And the politic of the green horse or the pale horse is to say that, man, when people are sick, you know, you got to quarantine them. You got to put them on the island so they infect each other. And, and that is like literally what Rome did. That's what they did with lepers. That's what they did with, with all these people. And the first four horses dismantled this myth of power and control, that Caesar, that Rome is really in charge of anything at all. That's what the first four horsemen do. So the, the next fill-in is this. Do we live in fear of sickness and in death or in the power of the one who has overcome death? See, so do you see how all these horses and, and that John is writing about and he's borrowing from this other book, he, he's, he's borrowing from this book of Zechariah in the Old Testament, and he's showing them, this is God's judgment on your empire, and, and he's showing them, you're not really in control at all. These horsemen, these powerful horsemen with weapons are in control. This lamb that looks as if it has been slain, that's the one that is really in control. Where the white horse and the politic of the Caesar says, be fearful of outsiders, exclude people, some people are better than others. The politic of the Lamb says we are all one in Jesus Christ. We are count, the, the counter politic of the Lamb is, is that he, he loves everyone. The next villain is this, the Lamb versus the horse. So I want to give you some of the politics of the Lamb now. We have no outsiders. There are only insiders. Galatians 3, 26-28. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no, neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, the politic of the white horse is to say, you know, watch out. These people have military power. You got to watch out. They, you know, this guy came in from this nation and they've got control. They, they've got a bomb. They've got this. They've got that. You know, you got to watch out for this person. We, we got to segregate and move them on. But the politic of the Lamb says that, that if you're in Christ, it, that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're not fearful of outsiders, but we're ever inclusive of all people because we love people. And we want to see them experience the redemption that we've experienced in Jesus. The red horse, remember the politic of Caesar with the red horse is to crush everyone who will rise up against me. It's a consistent recognition that God hears the cry of the oppressed. The last is first. Those people who get overlooked are the ones that need the places of highest honor in the politic of the lamb. So the lamb versus the red horse is this. The parts of the body that seem weak are really indispensable. This comes out of 1 Corinthians 12 verses uh, 21 through 26. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think are less honorable, we bestow greater honor. It is our and our unrepresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, 
which are more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lack it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And you might be saying, well, Pastor Dave, this is just in the church. Yes, the church is a counter kingdom to all the empires of the world. That's what the church is. It's a counter kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. That's what the church is. So the, the empire, the red horse, wants to get rid of everyone who doesn't fall in line. And, and the lamb says we need to give greater honor to people, have more patience with people, welcome everyone, and that we need to offer Jesus' redemption to all. But the red horse says, be suspicious. Watch out. You mean you're walking out into a red horse world. You're walking out into a white horse world. We're in a different kingdom in here. The black horse. Famine. I'm not sure that any of us are famine proof, by the way. Or even hurricane or tornado proof or earthquake proof, right? People who are shaped by this are constantly worried about stuff, right? The politic of the lamb is to say, uh, we can't control when the black horse shows up, but we can control the way we act when the black horse does show up. We can't control if there is famine, but we can control what we share. We can control our generosity. We can control the fact that we give to people. One of the most powerful things I've ever seen in my entire life is I was a Hurricane Katrina relief worker in 2005 with the Red Cross. I just got, I walked into the Red Cross one day. They were like, great. They slapped a badge on you. They're like, you're a relief worker. And they sent me on a plane the next day. I had no idea what I was doing. And I showed up to this shelter and a local Baptist church, before anyone else could get there, emptied their entire savings account to feed breakfast, lunch, and dinner to 425 people for a week before the Red Cross showed up. They didn't care. They just said, a disaster happened in our town. It's, people are more important than money. We need to empty the coffers. And they did. The most powerful is like food is scarce. What are we going to do? There's 400 some odd people. And it's like you, you start thinking, I got to feed my kids first. I got to do this. I got to do that. I can't let them in. And this church was like, no, we need to feed every single mouth. The lamb versus the black horse. This is another fill in. The politic of the lamb is radical generosity in every situation. The pale horse versus the lamb. This is the fear of sickness and in death. And even in Jesus' ministry, there was this group of people that, that fit the bill there, the lepers, right? And, and they thought, um, they, they, you know, a lot of people was like, hey, you, what you need to do with the lepers is you need to put them in seclusion or you need to die. Like, that's it. And Jesus walked over and touched them. And Jesus walked over to these people and with no fear, touched him. I love that. When you read further in Revelation, there's more talk of sickness. And it's in chapter 18. And what John tells the church is, come out of her, come out of her, great Babylon the whore. That's what he says. I'm not trying to just stand up here and say shocking things. Or else you'll share in her sicknesses, you'll share in her diseases. And so what he's trying to say about this pale horse and the counterpolitic of the lamb, you have to remember, this horse, by the way, summarizes the first three horses. All these horrible things happen. It's a graphic reminder of the consequence of sin. But the politic of the lamb is to not share in the sins of the empire. That's your next fill in. That's the politic of the lamb, is that we're not going to share in her sins because spiritual sickness comes from that. When we watch the news, we should not be surprised when an empire acts like an empire. And we don't need to remember that we're not shaped by Caesar's politic, but by the politic of the lamb who was slain. I want to read the very best statements I could find in the Bible about the politic of the lamb. And I want to invite you to, to look at these with me and to write them down and go back and look at them because I think that they're just so key. They're, they come out of Romans 12. Three through five is the first one. For by the grace given to me, 
I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than you ought to think, but think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have all the same function. So though we are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. So the first politic of the Lamb that we see here is, don't think that you're great at the expense of someone else. Like, don't think of yourself better than everyone else. Instead, with sober judgment, realize that we're in this community of faith together, we're in the kingdom of God together, and, and that we're equals in this. Yeah, I might be the guy who's called to come up here and, and give you this text and teach the word of God, but you're called to something incredibly just wonderful too, whether it's to serve. Maybe some of you are called to ministry too, and you should be up here teaching. Honestly, some of you are that good. You should be. We're all called to different things, and the idea is not to think of yourself greater or more highly than anyone else. That's the politic of the Lamb. Let's jump down to verse 9. But let love be genuine. Man, Maybe that just needs to be like a verse you memorize, just a set, one sentence in the Bible you memorize. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another showing honor. Is that foreign in our world today? Yes. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. But bless those who persecute you. This is the politic of the Lamb. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is like a counter ethic to the ethic of the, the, the white horse. Because we have to, to learn to live in this next, next sentence. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but be overcome with good. I used to always love that verse about heaping burning coals on their head because I thought, oh, this is the way you get judgment. I've done a barbecue before. I know how this works. But then I went to Israel, and they messed it all up for me. And they told me that coals back then was done, made with the broom bush. And the broom bush is exactly what it sounds like. It's a bush with long needles that they made brooms out of. So you can imagine that. And the coals that they would produce, if you would heap those on someone's head, it would just be like a small annoyance, and it would cause them to scratch their head. You just brush them off. That's what you're doing by showing kindness to your enemies and loving those who persecute you, is you're heaping burning coals on this head, on their head, and you're causing them to consider, what horse do they follow? Well, they don't follow a horse at all. They follow the lamb. And you're causing them to consider, maybe I should follow that lamb too. The politic of the lamb is a very different politic church, and we're called to that. When you learn the politics of the lamb, you're not defeated by evil, but you defeat evil with good. What could be more countercultural than a community of people that rejects the Caesars of this world and lives by the politics of the Lamb? This morning, when I say politic, what I mean is our action. Do you buy into the politic of the white horse of the Lamb? Do you buy into the politic of the red horse of the lamb? I mean, do you buy into the politic of the black horse of the lamb? And do you, do you fear and succumb to the fear of the pale horse? Or do you, do you live in the confidence of the lamb?